I'll introduce the speaker. Uh, Barry Mazur did his PhD in Princeton, age 2021. And in his thesis, he proved a conjecture in topology that had been open for over 50 years. He then moved on to Harvard, where he stayed till today. And he's currently the Gerhard Gade University professor. In his work, Professor Mazur uh, moved on from geometric topology to become one of the most influential number theorists in the world. And his work, for example, played a fundamental role in Andrew Wiles proof of Fermat's last theorem for which he has received numerous prestigious awards, such as the Webland Prize in Geometry and the Cole Prize in Number Theory, the Steele Prize for Seminal Contribution to Mathematical Research. And he's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and a member of the American Mathematical Society. And in 2011, he was awarded one of the National Medals of Science by President Obama. And it's a huge honor to have you with us, Professor Mazur. Um, I would hand over the stage to you. Well, it's a similar honor for me and a pleasure. And um, uh, I'll start with the question of my title, why study the arithmetic of curves? And the thing about rational points on curves is that they are um, in three subjects at once, arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. And that has fascinated mathematicians from the ancients to now. And the why in my um, title, why study the arithmetic of curves, is going to be um, uh, the thing I'm gonna lean on in my, um, in my lecture here. In fact, you can ask on a more uh, let's say meta -math mathematical level, what does it mean to say why in mathematics? And uh, I'll be interested in that and, uh, and anything anyone will have to say in our uh, question and answer period, which I hope will be uh, lively. Um, the background question uh, that I'm going to focus the talk on is something that's interested me for years and was actually the theme of a lecture I gave a few years ago about <clears throat> uh, what's known as Mordell's conjecture and is now um, the uh, classical uh, Faulting's theorem. Well, the Mordell's conjecture um, was framed in 1922 and half a century later was uh, finally proved. Uh, and here it is, I've put it in blue. Um, I'll, dis I'll discuss it a little more in a little more detail uh, uh, later, the notion of genus and algebraic curve. But the statement is an algebraic curve of genus greater than one defined over either the field of rational numbers or any number field of finite degree over the rationals has only finitely many rational points over the field of definition. So here's an example. Uh, and uh, the reason why I want to focus on this example, well, there are many reasons, but one is um, that one is already in the business if one deals with plane curves, that is say, um, uh, curves given by a uh, polynomial in two variables, x and y. So uh, the one I've um, put in a box there in the middle of the screen is y squared equals x to the six plus x squared plus one. And this happens to be a curve of uh, genus greater than one. It's, a, um, it's a genus two, in fact, and has um, only finitely many solutions with uh, x, y, rational numbers. Now, what I have at the bottom of this screen, I hope you can all see it, is um, the uh, link to uh, the lecture I gave largely about this curve. Uh, it's called the Einstein lecture um, some years ago, and the, there's a video of it. And uh, it uh, focused a bit on the why question, you know, why study uh, curves and uh, other why questions around, uh, for example, this curve, and it's done, uh, I did it in 
perhaps a bit more technical uh, language that I will then I'll give at this talk, but um, do take a look at it. It's not that technical. And it will uh, sort of respond to a lot of the missing points in the, um, <coughs> in the lecture I'm giving today. So the query that um, I've been sort of fascinated by, especially in this um, Mordell conjecture context, is that there are many proofs of it. There are many proofs of Fulting's theorem. And these proofs come from completely different directions, make use of quite different uh, structures and techniques of proof. And now if you have only one proof of something and you ask, why is that something true? Well, you say, well, there's the proof, that's why. The minute you have three completely different and um, uh, incomparable ways of proving that a certain set is finite, you find yourself wondering, sort of, again, you know, why on earth is S finite if we have that many different uh, disparate ways of trying to understand uh, it? Um, now, what I uh, focus on here are three different answers to the question, why are there only finitely many, finitely many points on um, algebraic curves of genus greater than one? But in fact, there are, many, <laughs> there are others as well. I mean, it doesn't end. Uh, and a natural overarching query or question is, um, is there a way of unifying these different answers to it? to organize them, to syncretize them, or maybe even to find a much more general viewpoint that it encompasses them all. Now, the thing is, I can't at present. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine any road to making such a unification of the many proofs of Mordell's conjecture. And I put this little italics line at the bottom of this screen here um, uh, it's a very current issue to unify these approaches. For example, yesterday I went to a lecture where a fourth way of proving Fulting's theorem was being unified with the third way I'm going to tell you tonight. And uh, the unification is uh, in some sense a conjunction or emerging rather than an overarching unification. So uh, it's not only an interesting question and it uh, has um, uh, concerned me for years, but it's uh, very topical. It's very current and people are trying to really do it. Okay, now the thing, uh, the conundrum that's posed by different proofs is uh, that um, sometimes different proofs that we um, naively call the same theorem are often actually proofs of significantly different generalization of the theorem and of course offer possibly different explanations for why the theorem is true. Now the Pythagorean theorem, which everyone knows, is uh, a, a really amazing example of this. I have um, um, picture of the Pythagorean theorem in Legos, and that's because um, um, downstairs um, uh, right now is my uh, granddaughter who is doing online schooling in our house, and uh, Legos is a big, big issue. But uh, to uh, give uh, at least a picture of the Pythagorean theorem that gives both the um, um, the statement of it as uh, uh, a certain area is equal to a sum of two areas, or to give it in more algebraic terms, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, um, I'm sure everyone knows uh, what uh, the theorem is, and surely people also know how to prove it, at least one way or another. 
Now there are hundreds of different fruits. So you could start, um, I, I just chose one at random. Uh, suppose you start with a square of size A plus B, that's, so the square here is, do you see my cursor by the way? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, A plus B uh, squared. And uh, you see, uh, well, if you were an algebraist, you realize that in order to get a C squared, that is say um, uh, a, a square um, whose side is C in this A plus B squared, you've got to subtract uh, two AB, or that is say four areas of the initial triangle. And my gosh, uh, a 12th century mathematician, uh, Bashkara, if anybody has uh, ever encountered his uh, mathematics, it's really wonderful. You should take a look. Um, and also, uh, there's an independent Chinese origin to this proof. But uh, uh, four of these uh, uh, copies of the initial uh, right angle triangle um, plus the square built on the side of the, on the hypotenuse, or the square whose side is the hypotenuse of the triangle, um, produces a plus b squared. And that was um, uh, uh, known uh, at least um, uh, 800 years ago. But th that's only one. And there are, if you go to a certain site in the internet, uh, there was, uh, when I looked, uh, 367 different proofs, but they keep adding, so there are probably more now. And also, uh, if you want to take a look, I have a, something that I call King Lear Light, which is uh, another proof of, um, I mean, it's not mine, but I mean, I, uh, but it's another proof of the um, uh, Pythagorean theorem. And do take a look at it if you want. Uh, a good exercise is to take a few of these 367 proofs and see, see whether you can organize them into a single package. Or are they really proofs of quite different theorems, which uh, some of them actually are. Uh, in quite a different direction with a quite a different um, problem in mind, uh, there's a really marvelous little book called uh, 99 Vari Variations on a Proof. If anybody um, is interested in seeing what this is all about, do take a look at it. Now, uh, but I'm interested in um, algebraic curves and therefore Diophantine issues. Uh, the first uh, Diophantine problem, of course, um, began with the Pythagorean equation, if you want, a squared plus b squared plus c squared. And uh, the um, a uh, list of Pythagorean triples can be found on ancient, very ancient papyri, um, rather beautiful uh, list of numbers. But the ancients were also interested in squares from many other uh, viewpoints. And uh, uh, there's a specific, rather beautiful problem uh, of Diophantus. And this dates from the third century AD. I'll read it. <laughs> Find three squares, which when added together, give a square, and such that the first one, let's say the first square is the side, that is the square root of the second, and the second is the side, the square root of the third. So this is how uh, Diophantus posed his problem. Um, of course, uh, we would pose it slightly differently. So uh, the way we would pose it is uh, we have a sum of three squares that's a square. Uh, so the first square is the side of the second. Uh, so the second, if I have the first square I call x squared, the second I'll call x to the fourth. And if x to the fourth is the side of the third, the third would be x to the eighth. Uh, so I would have an equation, x squared plus x to the fourth plus x to the eighth is a square. And of course, if I divide by x squared and flip, the, um, flip around the equality sign, I get this uh, um, plain um, uh, 
algebraic curve, which I uh, um, um, put on one of the earlier slides. Now, Diophantus gives a solution. X is a half, and you can work it out, but it works. A half squared plus a half to the fourth plus a half to the eighth is nine sixteen squared. But what's amusing is uh, the hint about how he arrived at it. He's, he noticed that if you take any number, a, and add a half to it, and you squared it, you got this. So if you take a to be one half to the fourth, well, then its square is a half to the eighth, and uh, it itself is a half to the fourth plus one half squared. And by golly, it was the square of something, so he, he wins. <laughs> but of course, what Diophantus won was just one solution, this single solution. Uh, us more moderns, not Diophantus very often, or at all, maybe. He, didn't, he wasn't interested in quantifying overall solutions. That, at least I don't, I mean, there are so many of his problems that don't do that. Uh, but we tend to do that. We have a problem. We want to know not only a solution, but all solutions. So find all solutions of this above problem in positive rational numbers. And um, that was achieved 17 centuries later. <laughs> Diophantus solution, x is a half, and is the only such solution. Let us say the only positive x coordinate of a rational point on this curve is x to a half. And it is proved in um, a thesis of um, a 1998 Berkeley thesis, um, where uh, we will talk a bit about, a tiny bit about the method, the type of method that he uses. But what I like about this is the, the cross-century conversation. The, these um, conversations can be fruitful um, and even coherent. They, uh, that means that there's a real stability re regarding our language, our common language. We have shared modes of expression and modes of operation that don't uh, uh, flit around. So why study uh, points on curves? I have um, a close friend who's a gardener who likes to um, uh, uh, separate the world into two uh, things, agriculture and horticulture. Agriculture being the practical, the, the gardens that produce food and horticulture being the beautiful gardens that produce flowers. And um, if anything, uh, the study of rational points contributes both to agriculture and horticulture for mathematics. So what about it's being practical? Um, by the way, can everybody see the whole screen? Yeah, you don't see your, your pictures <laughs> on the side. I, I do, but that's all right. I think you can change the view. Um... At the very top of a screen, oh. there's a thing which has view options. And then if you tick side by side mode, then you'll see uh, the, uh, the slides and your picture separately. Oh, I can get it. Oh, oh, I'm, I've done it. Hey, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so practical. So sometimes an algebraic curve or uh, the, the analog of algebraic curve, let us say varieties of higher dimension, um, presents itself as a sort of museum for some specific genre of mathematical object. Ah, oh, ah, oh, aha, uh -huh, there's something. I did that and now I yeah, I can. Uh, you'll have to switch back to the other window with the slides. Okay, I have view. Hmm? Yeah, does that work now? What? I, th I think this works now. We can see you changing slides. 
Yeah, yeah, okay, very good. <laughs> Thanks, I need some guidance here. Okay, um, okay, let me, let me do that. I say sometimes uh, a, um, uh, an algebraic curve is sort of a museum. For example, this one that I've, I've, uh, I've drawn uh, is a, a, a museum of mathematical objects in the sense that every point corresponds to a mathematical object. And as you move from point to point, you um, move from mathematical object to object. And the, these objects of this are of the same uh, genre or the same species if you want. There are variations of one, 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 one or, another, or, or another. And so therefore, in order to find uh, what uh, these mathematical objects are or to classify them or to, uh, even to understand them, uh, you find yourself uh, reduced to finding points on algebraic curves. And not only that, if the point on the curve is rational over some field, the corresponding mathematical object is um, defined over that field. So you have a really not, uh, not only geometric description of it, but in some sense arithmetic and algebraic description of its uh, structure. Now when you have such a curve that is one of these um, uh, museums, um, uh, it's called, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's usually called a, a modular curve or a variety of moduli for whatever genre it is classifying. So to find all the mathematical objects of, uh, of that genre, you can, uh, over, over a given field, you're led to the problem of finding K rational points on the corresponding modular curve or if it's a higher dimensional, it's very often called variety of moduli. So this is a basic tool for determining objects of interest. Well, uh, let's go back to Pythagoras. That projective plane curve is, if you want, the moduli space of, uh, if you can either, you can describe it in various ways, but I wanna describe it as the moduli space of similarity classes of labeled right angle triangles, because if you have a, uh, um, a solution of, um, of that equation in A, B, C, you construct a right angle triangle with uh, appropriately labeled signs. So uh, the, if you want, the, the positive rational solutions correspond to isomorphism classes of right angle triangles with rational length sides. Okay. Now, um, if you want rational length si sides and you want to get um, a lot of them, there's something called the sweeping method. That is to say, you can consider a fan of straight lines with rational coordinates that meet this curve at one rational point and since the curve is a degree two, each straight line meets the curve at exactly one other point, which is also rational. And so therefore you get uh, yet another uh, Pythagorean triple, if I want. Now this sweeping me method works for any plane conic. You just take your plane conic, take a, uh, if it has a rational point, you, uh, um, uh, pin a fan of uh, straight lines with rational coordinates uh, at that rational point and their intersection will produce, uh, each one will produce a unique other rational point, point ne necessarily rational uh, over whatever field this is being defined because after all the curve itself is rational and the um, straight line is rational and so is this point. Well, of course, sometimes uh, conic may uh, have no rational points. For example, this one. Just to give another example of a moduli space. Um, 
suppose you want the moduli space of right angle triangles with sides A, B, C and have fixed area capital A. So I'm thinking of the family of right angle triangles with that fixed area. Now, uh, so what do I have? I have a little a, a little b as a parameter. The c is determined by the a and the b. So is the capital A. So it's the a, little a and the little b that are the parameters of these things. Um, but I can find uh, new parameters just by um, doing a bit of uh, algebra. The red um, things on the right, of, right hand side of these equality signs are just the obvious algebra that you do to produce uh, these new parameters. And these new parameters are, uh, you can get back to the new parameters from the knowledge of X and Y. Hold on, can everybody see this? You all can see it. Oh, great, yeah. okay. Um, uh, just by um, uh, solving back those equations. And so therefore, what do we have here? We get the modular curve of right angle triangles with area equal to A is just given by that boxed equation, y squared equals x cubed minus a squared x. And um, you work that out, this is very easy to work out. And we, you see that right angle triangles with area A are parameterized by this curve. Now this has uh, quite a history. Um, the uh, areas A that occur for um, uh, um, uh, rational sides or integral side uh, uh, triangles are called congruent numbers. And so uh, from what we've just said, I say here on the slide from the above discussion, uh, uh, A, capital A is the area of such a triangle if uh, the equation that relates the y and the x, the two parameters, uh, is satisfied. Let us say if this uh, cubic equation has a solution uh, where u and v are uh, um, rational numbers, x equals u, y equals v. It turns out that if there's one such solution for a given area, there are infinitely many. Or to put it another way, if there's one right angle triangle with rational size of a given area, there are infinitely many with the same area, which is amazing. That is to say, if this equation has one solution, it has infinitely many. Now I've talked, I've discussed three types of algebraic curves. The Pythagorean curves, the curves connected to the uh, 10th century congruence number problem, and the curve related to Diophantus' problem. And um, the reason why I chose them is uh, they're members of the most basic trichotomy of algebraic curves, namely uh, curves of genus zero, of genus one, and genus greater than one. This uh, trichotomy makes, uh, uh, establishes um, a uh, uh, distinctions that are sort of very important for the solution of, um, uh, of equations for finding rational points on these curves because uh, curves of genus zero and of genus one and genus greater than one, they behave entirely differently one uh, uh, from another. The genus of a curve is, uh, it's the fundamental geometric numerical invariant. It just depends on the topological surface defined by the complex points of the curve and it counts the number of holes in the surface. So uh, that trichotomy, um, a genus zero, topologically, uh, the Riemann surface involved is a two-dimensional sphere. Uh, genus one, topologically, it's a torus, and genus greater than one, it's a many-hole torus. And the arithmetic of them, these curves differ substantially. Genus zero, um, 
an application of one of the standard theorems in um, uh, uh, algebraic geometry of curves, if you want, uh, gives that any smooth projective curve of genus zero over a field can be expressed as a conic. And so that sweeping method I described before gives us that if such a curve has a single point, even just a single point over field K, it has the fan of points parametrized by uh, the projective line of all lines passing through that point in the plane. So if uh, K, for example, is any infinite field, uh, that means infinitely many points. And the cur uh, curves of genus zero also have a neat local to global property and sometimes called the Hassett property and just says uh, that if you're of genus zero and you write it as a, the, you write that curve as the zero locus of an equation or of a system of equations with integer coefficients. And if uh, that system of equations or equation has a point of the reals. And if for any positive integer n, it has a non-trivial point mod n, then it has a rational point over q. This uh, goes under the um, uh, uh, logo locally soluble uh, implies globally solu soluble, but of course, globally soluble will also imply locally soluble. But uh, the minute you pass from uh, connex to higher degree, you're in much more subtle arithmetic. Uh, <clears throat> first, there's this <clears throat> local to global issue. Um, I think everyone working in this area has memorized the um, um, this equation three, it's easy to, easy to remember <laughs> three X cubed plus four Y cubed plus five Z cubed equals zero <clears throat> because it's a, a cubic curve, very simple coefficients. Um, and it has the um, strange property, strange from the vantage point of conic curves, a strange property to have non-trivial points mod n for any n. By non-trivial, I mean not all x, y, and z, zero, of course, uh, mod n for all n, and also has real points, but it has no rational points. So it doesn't have the local to global property. Now, uh, smooth plane cubic curves are curves of genus one. Um, uh, but if a curve of genus one over any field has a K rational point, you can re-express it. You can change the coordinates or the, and the um, uh, equations of the curve to express it as a plane cubic curve and that rational point that you have uh, focused on, uh, you put at infinity. And the minute you do this, there's a canonical commutative algebraic group structure on that curve, let us say on the points of that curve, with the point at infinity equal to the origin. Um, the typical picture here is, here's my cubic curve. If I have um, uh, any two points, P and Q, I just draw the straight line and going through P and Q. And since uh, it's a cubic curve, it'll hit or not, it'll hit uh, uh, that uh, cubic curve in exactly one other point. And that one other point uh, will have the virtue of being the negative of uh, P plus Q. And if you define P plus Q that, that way, you will uh, discover that uh, you've got a group structure. That is to say, and uh, not obvious at all, but um, uh, it's certainly obvious that this is a commutative group. What's not obvious is that it has a, um, uh, an associative law that satisfies the associative law. So such a thing called an elliptic curve and the set of its K rational points, which is therefore a group, uh, is um, 
uh, is uh, a billion group, and it's called the Mordell Bay group of that elliptic curve in honor of um, um, a classical theorem of Mordell, who proves that uh, these things, at least when k is the rationals, uh, these uh, Mordell Vey groups are finitely generated. And this is extended by Vey to uh, work for all number fields. Uh, e of k is finitely generated, and even to higher dimensional versions of elliptic curves called abelian varieties. Now, uh, one could uh, wa uh, talk for years about uh, this, um, the issues having to do with Mordell Vey. And we're only at the beginning of an unfolding story. But um, I'm onto curves of genus greater than one. And there, of course, there's a well-known and dramatic prehistory of the subject, namely uh, the Fermat curves. If n is uh, four or more, they see these will be, give us curves of genus greater than one. And um, uh, the general question, oops, the general question, uh, the general question of the arithmetic curves of genus greater than one began with uh, Mordell's conjecture, and that was um, that uh, the uh, conjecture uh, that I stated as a theorem at the beginning of this uh, hour, a curve over a number field K of genus greater than one has only finitely many K rational points. Okay, so for example, Diophantus' curve has only finitely many Q rational points. Now, as I said in the beginning, there's an assortment of essentially different arguments to prove this thing. And some of these methods, very interesting methods, by the way, work only under further hypotheses, which I won't worry about. That is to say, even if they don't give a complete proof, they give a proof in certain contexts, and that is interesting enough for me at the moment. Um, but all of these methods have been uh, uh, chiseled, augmented, sharpened, amplified, and in various ways simplified and generalized after their initial discovery. So uh, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to hint at here rather than talk about is um, a work built by many mathematicians in collaboration and separately. Uh, so in this list, I'm only going to, uh, there's no point in giving lists of the people here that I'd be going too fast. But in this list, I only name the initiator of each method. But I do give a, a sort of a more um, detailed framing of these uh, attributions in the link that I suggest you take a look at. So the methods are due to uh, Chabotis uh, in 1941 gave a proof, but not a complete, it, it, it required some conditions. Uh, Faltings, as I said, gave the first full proof uh, um, uh, half a century later. Uh, no, uh, well, 40 years later, and Voita, uh, a totally different proof, 10 years later, and these are the three that I want to choose. There are others. Um, before I do that, I, the question I'm, one might raise is, what, do you, what does it mean to prove finiteness? So when you claim that a set of uh, rational points on a curve is finite, you might mean, for example, that you prove that there's an explicit constructed upper bound on the heights of those points. The height of a rational number is uh, you first you take its absolute value and you express it in lowest terms uh, is uh, either its numerator or its denominator, whichever is larger. So there are only finitely many uh, rational numbers of any bounded height. So if you prove that there's a bound, a finite bound for the heights of k rational points on a curve, you prove finiteness. Or you might just prove that there's a, an explicit 
constructed upper bound on the number rather than the height of rational points. Now, if you've actually bounded the heights of rational points, uh, it's conceivable that you've uh, actually found a way of getting the full set of rational points. That is to say, if your bound isn't too high, you systematically test by computer, for example, all the points of height less than or equal to bound to see if they yield points on the curve. Your bound might also allow you to compute an a priori finite estimate, the amount of computer time it would take to resolve this. If you just bound the number, the best would be if you're upper bound with the actual number of rational solutions. So as you search systematically uh, in rising heights, looking for rational solutions, if you find as many as your solutions as you're bound, you, you're done. But you won't know before this happens uh, when it will happen. You would ne not have an a priori time estimate for when such a thing might happen. And in many setups, oops, in many setups where one has an upper bound for the number of rational points, that upper bound is far greater than the actual number. Now, all the proofs that we know are of the second type, they only bound the number, but not the height. So we're nowhere near um, uh, uh, giving, in some sense, a full understanding even of this collection of curves, curves of a genus greater than one. We're left with this fundamental question, is there an algorithm? You put as input a curve of genus greater than one, and the algorithm should give an upper bound for the heights of points, and therefore uh, run your computer and you'll get them all. <clears throat> May I ask questions? Oh, yeah. Um, so you said that we have uh, different ways of bounding upper bound, so finding an upper bound for the total number of rational points. Do we also yeah. have lower bounds, or how how well do we know these bounds? And so, do do we know how good these bounds are? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. And look, there are. Um, I, I, let me give you one example. It's a classical example. It's uh, been resolved um, well for probably uh, close to 30 or 40 years, 40 years, maybe, maybe 50, maybe more. Um, uh, we had a situation where um, we had a bound of a number of nine, nine points. And uh, we knew eight of them. Now, those eight points were really interesting. I mean, the, if you want the modular curve that's relating, <laughs> relating um, this, uh, told you um, uh, quadratic imaginary class, uh, uh, quadratic, quadratic imaginary fields whose class number is one. Um, so we were really interested in knowing the exact number, not only the exact number, we were really interested in knowing them. And it may have been a decade before uh, someone actually proved that there's no ninth point. So uh, even if you have a lower bound, I mean, you, 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 we, we don't have uh, at least systematic lower bounds that are interesting. Yeah, thank you. Our lower bound there was eight, <laughs> and our upper bound was nine, and there we are uh, for 10 years. Okay. Uh, could, could I ask something? Yeah. Is there an inverse correspondence? So given a set of finite set of rational points, could you construct a curve that works with these? Oh, construct a curve with only those points and and you're, but those points have to be somewhere. So are those points in the plane? That's a good question. This is a really good question, actually. Um, in other words, you're, uh, so, so here's, here's, here's your question. Um, 
take we want a, a, a certain amount of points so that we're guaranteed that uh, if there's a curve passing through those points, the curve is of genus greater than one, otherwise. Um, and we don't want too many such points so as to make that curve unique. So we're given its genus or something. So right. you, you say, take a reasonable number of points in the, in the plane, they're all rational. Can you wind through these points a curve that has these and no other points rational? It's, look, you've made my hour. I, 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 I may get back to you about that. I, I, I don't think I've heard that as a, as a problem. OK. Um, OK. So let me talk about my three, uh, my three choices of uh, proofs. The method of faultings. It's, what's great about it is uh, it's the first one. Uh, what's also great about it is that it actually gives a, uh, a, a number, uh, a bound on the number. Um, and, but the way it does it is it, uh, proves finiteness by proving finiteness of, finiteness of something entirely different, quite a different species of mathematical object. I put it in red. You don't have to worry about what that object is, but it um, lives in a completely different world than curves. A uh, finite number of isomorphs and classes of abelian varieties with good reduction outside a finite set of primes and a bounded polarization degree. It doesn't matter what it is. The thing is, uh, there are going to be vastly many more of these in any context where you would apply it to show that uh, a rational curve has finitely many. So uh, it's indirect and uh, it depends on the quantity of uh, isomorphism classes in a different aspect of uh, algebraic geometry. Um, uh, and I say at the bottom of this slide, I, I wonder whether anyone has worked it out explicitly, the bound. There is a bound, uh, but I don't believe anybody's ever worked this out for faulting. Okay, the method of Voita, totally different. It has to do with analogies that relate finiteness of rational points to problems in quite different, as I say, arenas of mathematics hyperbolic geometry and approximation of algebraic numbers or yeah, algebraic numbers by rational numbers. So here's Voigt's strategy. The first thing is he doesn't work with the curve X alone. He, he says, well, look, if we have infinitely many points, we can choose an enormous number M and consider uh, X to the M, the Mth, um, power x cross x cross x m times and we can list curves different curves of a very rapidly increasing height all the way out to p to p sub m and then that is what we're going to show it leads to a contradiction now the way he does that is he does it by um, uh, let's say imitating at least the shape of the proof of a very classical theorem, Roth's theorem. So Roth's theorem is uh, a theorem that asks the question uh, for uh, an algebraic irrational number. Um, how rapidly can we approximate that number by rational, by rational numbers in terms of the growth of the denominator of this rational number? So the theorem says that you fix this, rational, this uh, algebraic irrational nullity alpha, and for any epsilon positive, there are only finitely many uh, rational approximants, p over q, such that the difference is smaller than 
the reciprocal of the square of the denominator plus a bit. Now, how did he do this? He did it this way, Roth. Um, he supposed that there are infinitely many such good approximants, and he combined them um, uh, to make one a very, very long vector, p1 over q1, p2 over q2, and so on, uh, which is supposed to be a really good approximation to the diagonal m tuple alpha, 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 alpha. And then he's going to get a contradiction by constructing polynomials uh, with integral coefficients in m variables that vanish to a very high degree on this uh, diagonal um, uh, vector alpha, 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 but don't vanish on this uh, rational vector p1 over q1, p2 over q2, pm over qm. Now, why does that work? Well, uh, if it vanishes to such high degree at alpha, 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 that means it's a very slow growing. Um, uh, its values are very slow growing as you move away from alpha, alpha, alpha. And since um, the polynomial has coefficients in Z and this, uh, uh, this rational vector is rational, the minute it's non-zero, you have a clear lower bound. And uh, since uh, f of the diagonal thing is zero, a new approximates uh, 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 the diagonal vector and uh, is, um, um, uh, is so slow growing, you draw a contradiction. The third one is due to Chabotti. It's been now amplified by um, uh, Coleman, and uh, Kim, Robert Coleman, Mignon Kim. Um, now, here, I, I'm gonna give you a kind of fable. It's not quite right, but you'll see, I'll, I will um, modify it a bit uh, in, in a bit. Uh, here's a way of thinking about the method of Chabot T. Uh, and the only reason why I'm gonna do it uh, to the extent to the detail that I'm going to do it is to show you how vastly different, how really different it is from these other two very, very different methods. Okay. So imagine if for a curve over a number field, you had an algorithm even that produces a non-trivial analytic function or meromorphic function on the Riemann surface that the curve um, cuts out, such that for some reason, you have to know that this uh, meromorphic function vanishes on all the k-rational points. Well, then you're done, right? Because the function has only finitely many zeros. The uh, Riemann surface is compact. You have a a uh, meromorphic function on this uh, compact Riemann surface, only finite many zeros, your algorithm would have shown finiteness of rational points. And you can even uh, imagine more that it's algorithmically explicit so that in any finite time, the algorithm exhibits any finite number of Taylor series coefficients at any specific point that's desired. Well, then not only do you get something about the number, but you get more than just the number. You get a lot more information about those rational points. Um, now, there's no known finite as proof of rational points of a curve of genus one that follows exactly that above scenario, especially first because there are some hypotheses that one needs. The Chaboti method is not universal, it's not general. It's uh, subject to a hypothesis, which happily um, uh, happens uh, quite often. But if you replace the complex numbers by p-adic completions of the number field and replace the requirement that phi be uh, analytic or meromorphic on that Riemann surface by at the, the p-adic analog of that, that it's locally p-adic analytic, um, and um, given by power series on every residual disk, 
then the method of Chabuti uh, and uh, getting better and better, by the way, day, day after day, and I mean day after day, for example, yesterday, enhanced by Coleman and Kim and others, when it applies, proves finiteness by offering such a structure. And here's a cartoon that gives the, as I say, the barest hint of how the method of Chabuti and its recent extensions works. You take your curve and somehow you manage to embed it in some kind of linear space. And that linear space has a sort of rational point structure and all of the rational points of that linear space lies in a hyperplane, <laughs> some kind of hyperplane. Well, if the curve just uh, doesn't lie in any hyperplane, that curve is going to intersect that linear space, that hyperplane finitely, and you're done. <laughs> so uh, returning to Diophantus and the curve that we began our discussion with, it's non amenable to the uh, classical method of Chabot T, but uh, uh, as I said at the very beginning, recent extensions of this method, which as I say, day by day is uh, getting more and more powerful, can be applied to this particular curve uh, and uh, managed to prove that x equals a half is the only <clears throat> uh, rational point, thereby um, um, pleasing Diophantus, I'm sure, quite a bit. Okay, so that's what I had to say. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please ask loads of questions. Yep. I, mean, I think I'll start off with something very vague. So we have these different proofs. Um, do, you, do you think they should be related? Or do, do, you, do, do you think they should be unifiable? Or do you think they, they are just different questions that we somehow managed to pose in the same language? I, I, I think one should ask the question. I mean, I, um, as, as I said, um, we people have managed to uh, unify and relate uh, Chabotis methods with uh, other methods. And um, I can easily imagine um, Faulting's method being, Faulting's method has, gener has generalized now to prove theorems not only about um, uh, curves, but about um, sub-varieties of abelian varieties. And the beauty of uh, Faulting's method is he proves that if you have a sub-variety of an abelian, if you have a, I'll put it this, uh, I hope people don't mind if I use words that I haven't introduced, but an abelian variety is the analog in higher dimensions of an elliptic curve. It's a, it's a commutative algebraic group. It uh, has uh, rational points if it's, um, well, if it's, it's rational points uh, form a group and they form a finitely generated group if we're over a number field. Okay, now um, what Foltings proves is that if you have uh, any subset of points. Um, this follows part of your, <laughs> your question. Any subset of points in an abelian variety, um, and you take its what's called Zariski closure, that is to say the, s the smallest algebraic subvariety of the abelian variety containing those points, that <sighs> As, as long as your subset is a um, finitely generated as a subgroup, or if you have, um, uh, it, well, as long as it's finitely generated as a subgroup, that Zariski closure is a finite, there's the finiteness, union 
of translates of abelian subvarieties of that big abelian variety, of that ambient abelian variety. Now, that I could easily see be, and that's a more general theorem, but I could easily see that one might uh, wonder whether that wouldn't uh, connect to some extent with Chabotin. So it's not as if uh, it's hopeless. In fact, it's an interesting um, challenge. And even if one doesn't uh, manage, what does it mean about the, the problem that it, that it has so many ways of attack and they are not in some way integrated Thank you. You have a question? Um, yeah, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. For me, more the issue is I get awfully confused when you start working with number fields that kind of type. I like you know being able to touch stuff with the proofs with you know curves going through a plane and much like that. I think you started your work off doing much more you know geometrical stuff. Uh, you know, yeah. kind of Embedding. How did you make the switch to much more numbers? Oh, gosh. Oh, that's I a, have that's huge a, difficulty understanding. That's a personal. Okay, here, here goes. Um, how did I make the switch? Well, how would you recommend? Uh, okay, let, 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 let me let me let me let me say when I was young, um, I had these um, principles. I don't have any any. I don't have them anymore. <laughs> but I had these. One principle was I was fascinated by topology and uh, especially the work of Bing. The, has anybody, are you, is anybody familiar with uh, the work of R.H. Bing or Alexander? These are, uh, they're geometers or topologists working in three-dimensional topology and, um, and it's, it's quite a marvelous world in, in a way. Do people know what the Alexander Horn sphere is? No? They really wrapped around one with like two little pointy things coming. Like not, yeah, infinitely many. So you had to have an, you, you start with a balloon and then you make, uh, you, you take your fingers and you, you push out so as to interact, but not touch uh, a pair of fingers with another pair of fingers, so that it almost clenches, but not. And now you do this fractally. <laughs> you do it infinitely all over the place. And even on the little fingers, you do the same. Okay? So that's called the Alexander Horn sphere, because it has the property that its uh, complement is highly non-simply um, connected. So uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of weird. Now what Bing proved was you take two of these gadgets and they have the same boundary. I mean, they're, 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 he's thinking of them now as solid spheres with the boundary looking like that. You take two of them and you make their double. You identify the boundary of one to the boundary of the other. So you get a pair of Alexander Horn spheres put together, and here's what he proved. This is homeomorphic to the three sphere. In other words, <laughs> in the three sphere, you have this absolutely wild object. Well, um, I love that. And my thesis was, uh, was about something called the Schoenflies problem, uh, which had to do with embeddings of n-dimensional or yeah n-dimensional n spheres in n plus one space and the theorem is that topologically there's only one such embedding that's the theorem okay but i was so i was really interested in topology but i called them not my principle i call that pure topology <laughs> pure topology means I'm not going to make use of any smooth structure or differentiability or, I thought of that as a cop-out. 
that to be a real pure topologist, you work with topology with no structure except for topology. And of course, if you put an algebraic structure, a complex analytic structure on it, that's even worse, I mean, from my perspective then. And so that's, I was working there and then I got interested in dynamical systems and I proved the theorem with um, Mike Arton. Um, but for that, I, we had to use um, what are called Nash manifolds. A Nash manifold is a, um, a manifold that's essentially built out of real algebraic geometric objects. If you have a, if you have a real algebraic uh, uh, function, it'll have possibly many components. That corresponds to um, Hilbert's 15th and 16th problems. Um, and so um, uh, a Nash manifold is you take any one of these components and uh, that's a Nash manifold. It's no longer algebraic in any sense because it's, you've thrown out some of these algebraic components. But uh, um, we, we had to use these to prove the theorem that we were proving having to do with dynamical systems. So I became interested in real algebraic geometry and then from real algebraic geometry to complex and then mod p and you know, <laughs> and then downhill ever since <laughs> from the point of view of my principle. Thank you, yeah. Maybe any, if I can keep asking small tips on how to visualize number fields more geometrically. No, well, I mean, not something concrete, but like, this is well, a very okay, I'll give you an example. Question. I mean, this is, this, this is the thing that got me into number theory, really. Mm -hmm. But um, you can, it's, uh, uh, okay. The integers, which I'm going to call spec Z, because I'm thinking of it as a scheme. But this is a integers, you know, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, and so on. But, uh, Spec Z has the structure um, in some funny way has, at least is analogous to a three manifold, three dimensional manifold. And you can ask me why I can answer later. But now the beauty of three manifolds is the, in order to really understand their, or th the, it has uh, actually Spec Z is, is analogous to the three dimensional sphere. So, uh, the beauty of the three-dimensional sphere is in order to understand the three-dimensional sphere uh, uh, in some profound way, you have to understand knots, that is say, embedded circles in the three-dimensional sphere. And the way you understand them is by considering coverings of the three-dimensional sphere that are, that's branched at that, at that knot. And there's a theorem that says, um, um, for every integer, there's a, a covering that's branched at that knot um, uh, where the, uh, the group of deck transformations is the group, is the, uh, group of integers mod n for any n. And that just gives a few of the branchings. And then there are non abelian branchings that correspond to what are called Alexander polynomials of the knot, things like that. So if you make the analogy to spec Z, um, you find yourself asking yourself this question. Suppose I adjoin um, uh, P to the nth root of unity, where P is a prime, you have an extension of Z that's ramified only at that prime. And for every n, you have an extension of degree n, ramified only at that prime. So uh, are there non-abelian extensions that ramify only at that prime? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. And um, uh, in, in a certain context, uh, uh, you discover that uh, if uh, p divides an appropriate uh, Bernoulli number, there are. And you're in what's called Iwasawa theory and number theory. 
So it was Sarah theory and number theory and uh, the Alexander polynomial in knot theory, very, very, very close. So I was uh, focused on very early <laughs> in my move to numbers, I was focused on just this analogy between spheres and knots and the integers and primes. And um, uh, and in a way, the geometric or topological intuition helps here. You can, you visualize this in, a, in such a vivid way that it helps. It may not help in any uh, exact proof or precise um, uh, formulation, but it sort of, it just helps in um, organizing uh, illumination of uh, questions you might ask about primes uh, in Z as corresponding to questions you might ask about knots in the three sphere. Great, thank you. Yeah, even though my question wasn't well posed, that's exactly the kind of answer I was hoping for. But yeah. yeah um, Joel, I believe you have a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much for uh, a fascinating talk. Um, uh, uh, it's, it, it was uh, very nice and very, uh, very clear. Um, you, you've been talking about uh, developments in this field. I, um, now, you were talking, uh, uh, you know, a ma major theme is uh, sometimes you can establish finiteness of a class of object, even though you can't uh, place, uh, for instance, you can place a bound on the heights of these numbers. You can just say there's at most so many. So if, you, if one wanted to exhaustively find them, it's not obvious how to do it, unless you're in a situation where you say, well, I've got at most nine, and I've got, you know, at most nine, and I've got eight, and then finally somebody shows that, no, there cannot be nine. And, yeah. Um, is there is there work going on? Um, you know, for instance, you spoke about Roth theorem. A generalization of this is the the the, the subspace theorem, or the Piadic subspace theorem, for instance, which gives you finitely many mm -hmm. uh, subspaces. Now, it, do, do you know whether people are working on uh, kind of quantitative versions of these things? And by quantitative here, I mean not bounding the numbers, but bounding, uh, you know, some method that might give you an explicit enumeration of these things. That's a good are there conjectures to that effect even? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I know there are conjectures. I mean, there are, there are conjectures. Um, and I know Serge Lang had, was focused on, on that for a long time, but I don't know the current status of it. I, in fact, it's a good question. I will try to find out um, uh, where they are in actually getting height bounds for. I would actually be very interested in uh, uh, if you had pointers to such conjectures, maybe I can send you an email privately. And if you know, sure, do okay, please do, and I will I will try to retrieve um, uh, Serge's Serge Lang's um, conjectures about that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I had a question because um, I've, I've uh, read uh, quite a lot of papers. Bill conjecture and um, quite a lot. What? Sorry. Say it again. Say it again. I, I read quite a lot of paper about uh, the Bill conjecture, and mm -hmm. um, a decent amount of them um, uh, refer to the to effective uh, Chabotty. Uh, is it related in any way in uh, what uh, you talked about? Yes. Yes. Effective Chabotty. That's um, um, that's what I was trying to hint at in my. A discussion of Chabotie. Um The the person who made it effective was uh, Robert Coleman. Let us say Chaboti had uh, pretty much the cartoon that I had on my slide, and understood very well that if you have, in some sense, all you need for Chaboti is that the rank of the Mordel V group of the Jacobian is smaller than its dimension then you get all of the rational points of the Jacobian in some, if you do it right, you, you find it in some um, hyperplane or linear subspace, proper linear subspace in the Jacobian. And then the curve threads itself through the Jacobian and not in any such proper subspace. So it has um, finitely many uh, intersection points. Now that is not, um, yet 
terribly effective. But what Coleman did was um, uh, replaced replace this by actually finding differentials, sort of analytic differentials on the curve that mirrored what I just said. But he found, analytic, he found a way of, of producing analytic differentials on the curve that you could compute whose zeros on the curve would correspond to all rational points, would include all rational points. So it was Coleman who took Chabot T and made it effective, but he made it effective only if the rank of Mordel Bay is less than the genus of the curve. Nowadays, what people are trying to do is extend this uh, to situations where the rank is equal to the genus or more, but already um, in the, uh, um, uh, in that uh, curve that's on the, on the screen now, the, the rank of the curve is equal to the genus. And so you have to, you have to deal with Chabot T in a rather subtle way in order to get anything effective. And people are beginning to do that um, with uh, more and more uh, success. And also, uh, with the this specific curve, I mean, it's uh, noticeable on the, on the right hand side that you have a, you have actually a, a degree free polynomial in X squared. And um, I guess you can't really use this fact to show that there are not uh, that many points. Because, uh, no, I think not. No, no. No, it's. Yeah, because. No, this is a, it's a subtle curve, this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I ask a, a much less technical question? Mm. Um, so you've worked on the uh, arithmetic geometry, I guess, this field for quite a while. Um, what did it feel like to see um, Fermat's last theorem being proved? I guess kind of as part of this dialogue between centuries you've mentioned. What, what was that like for you? No. Well, it does, it did seem as if um, uh, an amazing amount of work not only came together at that point, but also opened up. The, I, you can think of the proof of Fermat's last theorem as an end result. I don't, I think of it as the beginning because one is not proving Fermat's last theorem in terms of there are no points and that's it. What one is doing is one is showing that the theory of modular forms and the theory of Galois representations are more closely related than um, you might expect. Now that's in one specific context, which is, um, which happily, solves the problem for uh, Fermat's last theorem. But the problem is the, the relationship between Galois representations and uh, modular forms opens up as a, 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 new, um, a new venture, a new adventure. It includes uh, nowadays Langland, the Langland's uh, correspondence. And it is a uh, um, and all of the methods for proving Fermat's last theorem are now tools, but just some of the tools for um, pursuing the Langlands correspondence in larger and larger domains. So it's a beginning. And yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question, but I, is that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So that was interesting. Um, Wilson, I think, do you have a question? Um, hi, um, Professor Mazer. Hello. Good, e good evening. Yes. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, so um, this is uh, probably not on the topic uh, we discussed today, but uh, probably it is. Um, so a lot of people have um, 
re recommended to me uh, your paper on Eisenstein ideals, but uh, I found it rather difficult to read. So, uh, um, what are some things I need to know before I attempt the sort of 140 pages? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, uh, the thing, I, I would say the thing that you might think of being up on is um, uh, all of Sarah's books. Sarah's books. Yes, yes, yes. I've read quite a lot of his um, books. Uh, you know, well, uh, covering Galois cohomology, covering, um, one, yes. okay. um, you know, and um, all, all of the basics. And also, um, uh, Silverman has a number of books. This is all in preparation for my, I, I, I'm not sure it's that much in preparation, but at least uh, to get um, uh, a real background in Galois cohomology mm -hmm. and uh, the basics of um, elliptic curves. Mm -hmm. I think one needs that and modular curves a little bit. Um, I guess I don't, I don't give a, 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 a reading list in my, in that paper at all, but um, I'm, I would say, I would say if you know Galois cohomology very well and a little bit of uh, the language of schemes, mm -hmm and background arithmetic of elliptic curves, I think you might be in, a good, in good shape. Uh, do, do I need to go through your monograph with the cats before attempting it? Or should I read them concurrently? No, 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 oops, oops. No. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's glad, it's, I'm very glad to see you today, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, but, but... Oh gosh, I've got to do something here, hold on. Okay. Okay. Um, we just had a new, new, t new, t hold on. <laughs> just had a new telephone, new internet installed because of you know, I have to zoom, right? I mean, <laughs> um, uh, so I had some distraction. Yeah, no, I would say Galois cohomology and a tiny bit of the language of schemes. Yeah, I, I know quite a bit of it, and I've read mm -hmm. most of Harshorn. Oh, okay, okay, very good. Yeah, I think you're in good shape. So Galois cohomology as at the level of Sayre's book? At the level of Sayre's book. Okay. And so a bit uh, beyond and, class field theory, I guess. Well, class field theory is, is I, yes, I would, I, I would hope that you do a little bit of class field theory too. Am, mm -hmm. I, am I piling it on too much? <laughs> no, no, I, I know quite a bit of it already. Oh, you just, do? Oh, great. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Just I'm yeah. a bit, uh, I find the 140 pages a bit daunting. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Um, right, so I think we have time for a few more questions left. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I will withdraw. Okay. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, please. Uh, yes. Can I ask a quick, maybe more fun one? Yeah. When I, um, I one thing that I would tend to talk about, a very fun story about you and your youth showing up late with a beer. Um, to an ROTC course that you had to take, so a physical ed course you had to take at MIT, which is supposedly a famous story. Did you show up late on purpose to mock the Navy, or was it just... Oh, absolutely talent? not. No, no, no. I was a uh, total... No, no, not at all. No. I took uh, ROTC, which is, a, you know, a, a training um, program, um, is required for... Well, was then, I think required for MIT, maybe not now. Um, and I took it uh, very seriously. It's just, it just that I was taking 10 courses for a semester. So, uh, you know, I had to make a triage of how much time I would spend on each. And I thought I could, could do a good job on 
on it, but I didn't do a good job on it. And so I had to take a makeup exam and that's, and the makeup exam was also during a, let's say an over, <laughs> an over committed moment in my life so that I did um, uh, sleep through it. But it was not intended. No, 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 I was very, I, I was, I had every intention of uh, doing a good job. Okay, thank you. Sorry for intruding that. It's just such a spectacular story that, you know, great mathematician shows up late. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I overslept. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <laughs> sure. So it was great to meet you all. Should I go on? What, what advice would you have for, like, some undergrad, like, who would have, who has principles just like yours? of doing only pure topology and not moving on? Oh, I would say be flexible. <laughs> flexible, yeah. And also, even if you have that principle, if you pursue that principle with imagination, it will dissolve on its own. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Sure. Yeah, thank you very much for... No, oh, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. And thanks. It's great to meet you all. And I'll... Um, Parth, uh, excuse I will think me. about your question. Uh, excuse me. I have a very stupid question that I want to left to the, to the end of the talk. Um, yeah. I guess the model conjecture is not related in any sense to the Riemann hypothesis, right? Ah. Uh. It's not, it's not, but it has a, what do I want to say? It's, it's not, I, I would say not. But the minute you asked that, I immediately thought, huh, the Riemann, Riemann's conjecture is about zeros of zeta functions. Suppose I asked about zeros of what are called L functions. L functions, uh, some of them have the property that conjecturally, uh, their, their, their order of zero at certain points, um, it's their, that order is conjecturally equal to the rank of the Mordell Bay group of something. So you could move Riemann zeros, Riemann function, L function, um, to order of uh, a zero of an L function to the rank of Mordell V somewhere. And then, you know, and then if you uh, want to apply Chabot T, you have to know the rank of Mordell V of various, uh, various opinion varieties. And so there is, I wouldn't say it's a, a connection. I would say that there are, um, there's a, a field of stones where you can jump from one stone to to the next to get to get to it. It's quite interesting to find a field of number theory that Riemann hypothesis doesn't provide an overarching idea. That's right. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. In fact, the more I think of what of your question, the more the the more I can imagine the stones being being placed closer and closer together <laughs> so as to be a real path from one to the other. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, and I think on that note, yeah, thank you once again. It was a very interesting talk. And yeah, thank, thank you for you. all the answers to the questions. That was a lot of interest. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for coming. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. Bye.